Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing great, and I hope you enjoyed your coffee. Um, let's see if we can see the presentation there to start um, discussing the topic for today. Um, as Okay, so we have it there. Okay, excellent. So uh, as you can see um, there, the, the title of my presentation is Designing Engaging Tasks for Contemporary Classrooms. Uh, so the focus of this presentation is going to be uh, engagement. How, how do we engage in, uh, students in, in their tasks? Um, okay, let's take a look at the purpose. So let me read it here. Uh, to provide a framework, the purpose of the presentation is to provide a framework for designing engaging tasks in the classroom based on the work of Zoltan Dornier uh, and other colleagues by explaining his theoretical model and showing possible activities. Um, this author uh, recently passed away, is Hungarian, so I probably pronounced his name terribly. Um, and uh, he came up uh, with a model of uh, engagement uh, that um, organizes a series of principles. Uh, many of these principles will not be needed to you, uh, but, but I think the, the, benefit, the, the beneficial thing, thing about his model is that um, he organized in a very coherent way, way uh, these, these principles. principles. Um, okay, now, now let's, let's take a look, look at, at the agenda. Uh, so, uh, so first we're going to talk about the conceptual framework. Uh, then we're going to talk about designing engaging tasks uh initiating engagement with learning tasks uh so we're, we're going to divide the design of uh, uh, tasks in two sets of principles the first one is how do we initiate uh engagement uh the second one is uh, uh sustaining that, that engagement how, how do we sustain it? Because, because it's, it's not, not worth it to start, start with, with a bang and, and then, then lose them, them or, or lose the student along the way. way. Okay, okay. And finally, I will recommend a book by this author where you can read uh, a couple more things. So um, a couple of um, just a disclaimer, a quick disclaimer. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information in the presentation um, because I really wanted to give you a general overview of this model. So um, I, what I would like you to do is just to take a look at the principles and have a, a, a general overview. And remember that you will have uh, access to the video where you can go back. And so probably you want, the, there will be uh, an overload of information, uh, but just remember that the idea here is to get a general idea and then go back and review, okay? So, um, I want to start with a, a little a quick activity. Uh, so imagine you've just taken the most interesting class you've ever been to. And I want you to list some of the things that happened in that class. So I would like you to use uh, the chat box. Uh, so I want you to complete this uh, sentence. I like it when the tasks in the class. So what are things that you like in tasks? thinking about this uh, interesting class, what, what do you like uh, the tasks to have? Okay, so let's see if we have, uh, if we have some, some comments there. I, I'll give you a minute to write. What are things that you like in tasks? What elements do you like to, to see in them? Let's see if we have somebody there. No. Okay, and so Tricia, we have uh, interactive activities. Okay, so interactivity would be one of the principles. Um, appealing, uh, we have Sandra, appealing and challenging. Okay, so uh, definitely we're going to talk about that. Uh, games, okay, so some type of uh, games, and we're going to mention games in, in different ways during the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I like it when people participate. Okay, so active. 
people are active during the tasks and dynamic and engaging. Okay, thank you very much for all those comments. Let's now imagine the opposite scenario. Uh, imagine you've just taken the most uninteresting and demotivating class you've ever been to. List some of the things that happened in that class. So you don't like it. Well, of course, we're going to uh, mention opposite things of the things that you just mentioned. But I would like you to, to say them anyway um, or think of other things. Uh, what don't you like uh, in tasks? Uh, what type of task, what are the characteristics of boring and demotivating and not engaging uh, tasks, non-engaging tasks? Can you give me a couple of examples? Okay. Well, of course, we can, we can use your previous comments and think of uh, the opposites, right? When people don't participate when they, yeah, they are not active, uh, when they are not challenging, right? When you feel like they are dumbing down the topic, okay? Uh, teacher-centered, thank you very much, Rosa Maria. Definitely, definitely, when they are teacher-centered. Okay, very good. And when the teacher talk, talks most of the time. So we're going to mention teacher talk during the, the presentation. Too long and not with a clear purpose. Okay, okay, so all these principles are going to be present here. Okay, so definitely, especially those of you who have been teaching for a long time, uh, many of these principles will be, uh, will be, will not be new to you. Uh, but I think th this is going to be a very coherent way to organize the planning. Okay, uh, so let's uh, move on to the definition of engagement. Um, Let's see, how would you define engagement? Um, how, or maybe let me put it another way. Uh, how would you define uh, somebody who is engaged? What are the characteristics? Uh, what is happening uh, in that person when somebody is engaged in a, in, a, in, a, in a task? Let's see if we have a couple. What is happening in their head, for example, or and well, there was a comment before when uh, of Trisha related to boring tasks. Oh, I'm going to move on to the to the new uh, comment of Trisha. Uh, involved, so when when somebody's engaged, they are involved and expressing ideas related to the topic being seen. Okay, involved. Compromise, okay. Maybe we could also say commitment. Uh -huh. uh, that somebody participates. And it's interesting what Daniela says, because um, that's true. When somebody participates, definitely they, th that's a sign of engagement. But we also need to evaluate the type of participation that they are having, right? Because they can be just simply active, uh, but maybe they are not engaged in the topic. Nothing is really happening. And when students are committed, motivated, interested, and enthusiastic about the task. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So let's take a look at the definition that this author uh, gives. Engagement concerns active participation and involvement in certain behaviors. In the case of student engagement in school related, uh, sorry, in the case of student engagement in school related activities, school related activities and academic tasks. So we have active participation, involvement in certain behavior. Okay, so uh, there's, there are lots of implications here. Um, and, you know, if we ask ourselves, and this may seem obvious to us, but it's still worth it to, to, to discuss it. Why is engagement crucial when learning a language? And when we're learning a language, you really need to be engaged and involved because learning a language, uh, one of the objectives is to internalize things. And you need to make connections. You need to make active connections. You need to reflect. Okay, so you, you're not just drilling things. Okay, you're just not repeating. You really need to be involved mentally. Okay, 
So let's take a look at the, the engagement model uh, that this author proposes. Okay, so as I said, many of these principles will be familiar to you, but I think this helps to have them organized in one model. So uh, now, sometimes we, we have a tendency to go and give teach our class and uh, just say, okay, well, I taught my class, but, um, you know, students didn't respond. It's not my fault. But uh, take a look at this quotation. Saying I taught students something, they just didn't learn it, is akin or is similar to saying I sold them a car, they just didn't buy it. Okay? So your job is to sell them a car and to have your students buy it. So it's uh, so when when you see that there's no engagement, there's something. It's not the student's fault. So, I mean, there are many scenarios, of course, that we can consider. Um, but uh, you know, we can reflect and say, what's what's going on? What's happening? Are are there any principles that I'm not applying? So how do we increase student engagement? Um, okay, now uh, engagement is a very complex topic. It has many areas. And the model of this author it includes many areas. Uh, we're going to focus on just two areas here in this presentation, which is the, desi the design of tasks. But I want you to have a, a, an overview of the whole model. Uh, so I just want, I, I will mention just a couple of other aspects that are important when we're talking about engagement. So we have one element, which is the context of learner engagement. And this relates to the attitudes and beliefs stemming from a host of contextual factors that affect both the learner and the school. So here we're talking about the context in general, uh, the institution, society, their family. Uh, so all these elements, of course, um, uh, are related. We will mention some of these things, how you can take them into account when designing a task. But uh, this is... a, a uh, a topic into itself. Then we have the facilitative, facilitative uh, learner mindset. This is uh, related to feeling of competence to learn a language and having some ownership and control over development and experiences. <clears throat> so this is related to uh, what's happening in the learner's head. Do they feel competent? Uh, do they feel that they are up to the task? Um, do they have the skills on how to learn a language? Okay, so this is uh, also important. Then we have teacher-student rapport, and this is self-explanatory. So uh, this is the development of a positive relationship with our students and reflection on how to make ourselves available and interact with them. If there's no rapport, it's difficult to engage students. Then we have positive classroom dynamics and culture. And this is related to the need to feel safe and accepted as, valued, as a valued member of a cohesive classroom community who also uh, have uh, specific responsibilities for their own and the other's learning. So this is uh, the idea of creating a community in the class. So there are, for example, activities where you community building activities, right? Where you, you, you try to develop this cohesiveness. And then we have the, the last two, which are the, the focus of uh, this presentation. So uh, designing tasks, how to initiate and how to sustain engagement. Okay. So uh, how do we design engaging tasks in, in the classroom? Um, and before I give you the principles, um, and well, sprinkled throughout the presentation, there will be practical, we, we will have some theoretical information and some practical information. So we're, we're going to go back and forth. Uh, a few preliminary, preliminary words that I think we need to clarify. Um, and I already mentioned something related to this. So being engaged is not the same as being busy. Okay, so we can, we can uh, have students do their work and, and uh, have them busy uh, and, uh, and keep them busy, uh, but maybe they are not engaged. 
Uh, so I'm sure this has happened to you. You're doing something, but you're not focusing. You're not making connections. So we can make uh, a distinction between those two. Um, now, uh, expectations. It is highly unlikely to ever achieve 100% high engagement for all learners at any one time. So don't feel uh, like a failure if you go to a class and uh, you know 80% of the students are engaged and 20% are not engaged. I mean, if 0% are engaged, are not engaged, then you need to reflect, right? But uh, um, we need to have, I mean, they are individuals. With, with their lives and, and different uh, aspects that can affect their engagement. Um, now, I will mention several principles, but the idea is not that every time you design a task and in every task, you need to apply all the principles. That's not the idea. The idea is that you, you, you include three, four principles in, in one task. Uh, and this is a number, kind of a magical number that this author mentioned at least three principles to apply. So don't think that, I mean, when, when I'm talking about all the principles, you're going to say, but how, how am I going to apply all this? That's not the idea. Just uh, select, depending on the task. It will depend also on the task. Uh, now, uh, there will be distractions uh, during the class, of course. So uh, it's important to tackle them uh, uh, beforehand. I mean, to, to uh, predict this possible uh, distraction. So we help students' tire, uh, tiredness. Uh, how do we deal with that? Well, we can give them uh, what they call power breaks, a little break where they uh, uh, freshen up and uh, maybe they stand up. They can do some type of activity uh, where they can uh, um, wake up a little bit. Uh, peer discord, when there, there's the community uh, building aspect is a little uh, askew. So, um, so seating and grouping arrangements, make sure that people who are working together are, um, are, uh, can get, uh, get along, okay? Uh, mobile phones, this is the ever, never-ending uh, problem. So uh, if you won't use uh, mobile phones during the class, and if it's possible, if the institution permits it, it would be a great if you could uh, collect them before the class, have them... Uh, somewhere where they can see them and ask them to, to keep them silent. If you're going to use them in class, um, then uh, the activities that you're, you're going to do, try to set, set time frames, very clear time frames, so that the room for distraction and, and moving to other apps is, uh, is uh, uh, more... Uh, we don't have such uh, room for distraction. Okay. Um, now, another, another thing, and here is kind of a change in paradigm. I want you to consider yourselves as designers of learning experiences. Now, the idea here is not just to come up with a fancy uh, name. This implies uh, a change in your uh, view of what you're doing. So, what are the implications of considering yourselves designers of learning experiences? You will focus on the user uh, and we're students as users. So we want to design for the experience of the students so that they can take advantage of what you're doing as much as possible. So this is an important thing. And uh, the, the meaning of task that we're going to use here is not necessarily the one defined by task-based uh, 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 teaching or task-based approach. It's just task is any language learning activity in class. Okay? So that's basically the definition of tasks. Okay. So uh, moving on here to the, to the topic, to the main topic. So we have two categories, initiating engagement and sustaining engagement. So um, I just want to point out that the division between these two sets of principles is a little arbitrary because they overlap. And you will see that what you use to initiate engagement will also help you to sustain it, okay? But it's in, uh, for pedagogical reasons, it's, it's a, a good division to have, okay? Uh, now, uh, we were talking about teachers are designer of learning experiences. So I want you to imagine that you are designing an attraction in an amusement park, okay? 
this um, comparison will help us highlight some of the things that I want you to take into account, but also this uh, comparison will help you um, um, put to rest some myths about your role as a, as a teacher. So uh, there are some things in, 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 this, type, in this type of uh, uh, metaphor that, will, that are very similar to what you will do, but there are some things that will be different. And so I think this is a helpful metaphor. So uh, we want learners to enter the attraction and to stay for the ride, okay? So uh, now, what, while you're listening to the presentation, I want you to, to ask yourselves these questions. Uh, which of the principles act or actions are already part of your current practice, fully or partially? And later, I'm going to give you a second to take a photograph of this so that you can have it in your phone, because there are four questions that I want you to keep in mind. So which are, of these principles are you using? Number two, are there any aspects of any of the familiar principles or actions that you would want to further strengthen in your practice in the future? Then, are there any principles or action points <clears throat> that are new to you? in the sense that you have not consciously considered them in the context of your teaching? And are they worth experimenting with? So the ones that you're not using, do you think it's worth it to use them? So please take a photograph of that, um, of those questions. So I just want you to, to, have, to have them in mind. Okay. Okay. So uh, the first set of principles, um, and, and by the way, I, I, I'm going to divide in two, in two parts each of these sections. First, we're going to talk about principles, then examples of their application. Uh, but when we're talking about principles, uh, as I said before, sprinkled throughout the presentation, you're going to find uh, some practical advice. So initiating, how do we initiate engagement? So here the challenge is to design attention-grabbing learning tasks. Um, of course, um, here the focus is attention. Okay, so how do we grab the student's attention? Because there are many competing things, right, in the world. Um, and this, this doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to need to design very complicated things. Sometimes very simple things are attention grabbing. Um, and we want attention because, of course, the brain focuses on what it perceives as being important. So the ultimate goal of task design is to make the learner's brains sit up, notice, and attend to the task at hand, okay? So that's the idea. And we can design tasks that get learners active, curious, and emotionally invested in wanting to learn and do more. So what are the principles for initiating uh, engagement on tasks? So this is an overview of all the principles, and I'm going to discuss each one briefly. Uh, principle one, design for the learners in front of you. And I'm sure this is not going to be new to you, right? We need to take it into account who, and this is the idea of uh, designing for the user experience. Principle two, get learners emotionally invested. Emotions are a very, very powerful thing that we need to use for our benefit and for the benefit of the students. Principle three, curiosity captivates. Uh, and I think uh, we all can agree on that, but we're going to discuss it later. Principle number four, concentrate on tasks set up. Many times we focus on the tasks that we're going to develop, but not on how we're going to present that task to the students. And uh, many times tasks don't work because of the setup that we did before, the way that we gave instructions, et cetera. And principle number five, learners need to be active to engage. Okay, so principle number one, um, designed for the learners in front of you. And here we have the principle in The Simpsons. Am I out of touch? He asks himself, he asks himself. No, it's the children who are wrong. Okay, so no, this is not the attitude. Okay, so uh, we need to be uh, in contact with the students, and we need to know who we are teaching. So, um, of course, we all recycle material. Our lives as teachers would be impossible if we didn't. 
Okay, but um, the idea here is not that you're going to design completely new tasks for each group, right? Um, no, the idea is that you're going you're to make small tweaks to these tasks uh, in order to fit uh, your group of students. Uh, now, how do we do this? Uh, if we have a large class and uh, we have many different uh, types of people, uh, it's very difficult to design something so generic that fits everybody. So you can start choosing. I'm going to start choosing a group of people that have similar characteristics and design tasks thinking of this group. Maybe this will definitely, uh, um, the idea is that this appeals to everyone, but maybe you're thinking concretely of a group of people. Then you're going to move to another group of people. So you can, the idea is that you have a concrete group of people in mind when you're designing the task. Now, here we are, uh, when we're talking about to knowing the learners in front of you, um, we are uh, focusing on five things. What do learners need to learn? And um, here, of course, we need to take into account the curriculum. Okay, so there's curriculum to, to pay attention to uh, and the learning objectives. Um, now, because uh, here, the, the idea is not only to design tasks that would be fun for your students. They need to have a, a learning objective. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so that's the first one. Uh, the second one, what are the learner's current abilities? So this is very, very important um, because the tasks uh, need to be uh, challenging enough but not too challenging and not too dumbed down, okay? So you really need to know their current abilities uh, in, in, in different areas, not only linguistic, but uh, in other aspects too. So what do learners like to do? Of course, uh, we need to take into account uh, their preferences, okay? What do learners want? And this is different from what learners need to learn. Uh, because what they want might not be the same as uh, what they need. So when we, we think and take into account what they want, we, we can, uh, when designing a task, we can uh, try to, um, um, to, to make the gap between these two things smaller, okay? Um, so, and we need to, we need to try to make these two things compatible. Okay. I don't know if I'm explaining myself. So I just, it's important that you make the difference between what they need and what they want and to take into account what they want and what are learners lives like. And uh, this is something related to something that we mentioned before. Um, some, uh, another aspect, uh, related to, um, this model of engagement. Uh, you need to take to, to be sensitive to what their lives are like. Uh, so this will influence teacher talk. This will influence uh, how you treat certain topics. Okay, so just uh, take into account their lives. Um, so, and, and this is uh, an expansion of this last point. So does the way in which teachers talk about and use language minimize or empower other speakers? Uh, do a teacher's approach approaches to and theories of language limit or respect diverse capacities for learning? So these are important questions. Uh, I'm going to skip here this one and move to the next to the next principle. Principle number two, get learners emotionally invested. So we what we want is completely the opposite of what we see in the picture. Um, so here, as I said, emotions are very, very powerful. So we need to use them, okay? So, and here we need to make a difference between two types of uh, interest. And again, maybe going back a little bit, when we talk about emotionally invested, what we want to do is to awaken their interest in what they are doing. But there are two types of uh, interest, situational interest and personal interest. Um, personal interest is a more permanent thing, is what interest your students as individuals, okay? And situational interest is 
the interest that a specific situation uh, we have, okay? So this is something that we can manipulate, okay? We can manipulate situational interest. Of course, we can take into account our personal interests and help situational interest, okay? Um, now, uh, when we're talking about emotion, and some of you mentioned this, we're talking about appeal. Uh, now, we can... Uh, Task design can captivate learners on three levels. There are three types of appeal that our tasks can have. Physical appeal, activity appeal, and content appeal. What is physical appeal? Uh, physical appeal is related to how things look, of course. So let's say you're using a handout or you're using some type of uh, um, uh, activity that you design uh, online, etc. So there's, there needs to be some appeal physically, aesthetically, okay? Uh, now, of course, here we need to be careful because physical uh, things can also be distracting. So things need to look neat, organized, clear, and attractive, but not, you know, you, know, you don't need to feel things uh, uh, with um, pictures and things that are not related, okay? So just be careful, okay? Uh, then we have activity appeal. Um, oh, activity appeal and content appeal. Let's talk about activity appeal. Um, what is activity appeal? So, of course, the activity needs to appeal to students. How does this happen? Uh, learners should feel competent and capable. So that's why you really need to take a, into a, account where their, their likes, their wants, uh, and their capabilities. Now, the process of working in the task should be interesting and enjoyable. A sense of mastery and autonomy should be present. Um, so what does this mean? Um, these, these are three questions that we can ask ourselves um, regarding the tasks that we're designing to see if they have activi activity appeal for your students. How much time, freedom, choice and resources do learners have on the task enough time enough freedom of course they the activities cannot be completely open but they need to have some some freedom um, and choice and do they have the resources to do the activity what different language skill areas are being employed um, where with whom and in what ways do they work with others Okay, so these are important questions that we need to ask ourselves. And there, there, there was another one. How pleasurable and attractive is it for learners to create the task output? Okay, and content appeal is related to the cho choice of topic. So, um, of course, we need to choose topics that are emotionally engaging. And here, uh, it's, it's important um, that we don't, since many times in classes, of course, we need to simplify the language. Uh, we think that we also need to dumb down the topics and the, and the types of tasks that we do. But you can have a task with simple language, but something that uh, inspires uh, some type of mental activity. Okay, so um, for example, here, just give me a second. Sorry. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, so, for example, um, let's see. For example, uh, if we have um, if we have a topic like animals, for example, we can uh, you can um, try to personalize, for example, the topic to make it more appealing for uh, the students or or something. Uh, along those lines. Okay, let me move on here to principle number three. And again, I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, thinking that you will have access to the video uh, later so you can go over, uh, over the video again. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, principle number three. Um, so curiosity captivates. So why do I include those pictures here in the presentation? Um, because curiosity many times is defined as a mental itch. 
okay, that you need, you really need to, to scratch, to scratch it, okay, to get rid of it. So uh, this is what we want to create in students, some type of mental itch. They are curious about uh, what's going to happen and about uh, the different things in the tasks. And uh, so this is something that we want to create. Now we have two types of uh, curiosity, epistemic curiosity and perceptual curiosity. Epistemic curiosity is related to um, the pleasure that you get just from knowing things, knowing for the sake of knowing. And then we have um, perceptual uh, curiosity, uh, which is, and let me read here the definition, is aroused by novel, surprising, or ambiguous stimuli. Um, so this is something that is, uh, um, you see something and that uh, creates that itch, or you hear something that uh, develops that itch. How do we develop epistemic curiosity? So uh, you can begin with the curiosity learners bring to class. Uh, so everybody as humans have certain topics that they are curious about. For example, the meaning of life, love, fairness, equality, life in the universe, and we can go on and on. Okay, so uh, try to think of, of topics that um, are inherently interesting for us. Now, encourage quest for depth of knowledge. Uh, so here, try to, try to use activities that um, um, uh, develop or stimulate this type of curiosity. So for example, project work, where they need to do research, uh, discovery approach, and I'm sure you're familiar with this type of uh, approach. Let me give you an example. Uh, you have the guided discovery approach to grammar, for example, where learners discover the rules. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Uh, this is an example of how, how you can, of course, there are many applications of these principles, but this is one in grammar. So um, let me just read it quickly. So in the first step, learners are exposed to authentic language in context, such as articles, blog entries, extracts from books. Then through guided, guided questions prepared by teacher, teachers or peers, learners analyze the language in use trying to, to deduce a rule. And then learners can be encouraged to find more examples of the language and rule, etc. So uh, this is an example of an engaging uh, type of uh, approach. Okay, and there's another, so another step. Learners present their understanding of how the language works uh, and their rule to the rest of the class. This can be done creatively. So you can, of course, make posters and this type of things. Um, okay, and uh, of course, many times we use a course book, so just ask yourselves if the course book uh, complies with all these principles. I'm going to uh, move from this uh, slide quickly, but just ask yourselves if the course book has those elements that I mentioned. And then we have perceptual curiosity, the itch that must be relieved. So here we need to focus on novelty and surprise, incorporate that. Um, if you have, uh, if your, your activities are always organized in the same way, we can say that familiarity helps sometimes because that reduces the cognitive load and students can focus on learning a language. But too much familiarity can also be uh, troublesome. So you can tweak. You have a, a task that you a task that you normally present in some way, and you can start uh, to uh, change them. Okay, and uh, this also applies to the content of the task. Uh, but this is important to to take into account. Then we have uh, puzzling, ambiguous, or gap in information. So puzzling things, things that they need to think about, uh, questions that uh, are puzzling. Things that are ambiguous that can be interpreted in different ways or, or a gap in information and they need to predict the gap. What might, might be, uh, what uh, fills that gap, okay? Now, principle number four, concentrate on task setup. And this is what I mentioned before. So this is important um, to plan also. So make sure that you don't have a very complicated setup 
and the setup is longer than the task that you're doing. Okay, so um, it's important that when you're giving instructions, they are simple. And here we have this uh, acronym KISS, keep it short and simple. So this is a good uh, uh, acronym or principle, principle to follow. Um, and uh, well, instructions need, need to um, comply with several aspects. And I want to move on to these aspects here. So um, task instructions, um, these are some things to take into account. Get everyone's attention before you begin and keep it short and simple. Describe what students will be doing step by step and model the activities if it is easier than to explain. Uh, and something that I want to add that I didn't include here and the author doesn't mention, but I think is also related to one presentation that we, won we will have uh, today. Um, or today or, or tomorrow, I don't remember exactly, but which is related to uh, translanguaging, uh, which means using uh, your native language in the class. If for some reason it's easier, it's a lot easier to explain the instructions in Spanish to get to the task as fast as possible, do it. Don't be afraid to do it. And, and uh, we're going to have a speaker who's going to talk about that. That's an important thing. Uh, and then be clear about what the product or output will be when finished and how it will be evaluated or utilized. Very important. What is the expected output and how you will evaluate it? Okay, so this is important. And help learners find value, utility, purpose, and meaning in the task by emphasizing the learning opportunities in the task. So they need to know why they are doing it. Why is it important? And this is uh, related to what they want and what they need. Make them make the, the purpose of the task relevant for them. Um, and uh, here, with the learner's appetite by pointing out something interesting about the task. So uh, make, make them curious about it by pointing out something uh, interesting about the task. If there's nothing interesting about the task that you need to point that you can point out, then there is something. There is something wrong. Okay. We have a question there. When you model the activities, students do a better work and enjoy more the activities than explaining it. Definitely, definitely. And and this is uh, thank you very much for the comments. Um, this uh, will depend also on the on the uh, mechanics of the task. If it's easier to demonstrate than to explain it, then demonstrate it. And if it's very complicated to explain it in, in, in a language that is uh, accessible, then do it in Spanish, no problem. Principle five, learners need to be active to engage. Okay, the opposite of the picture. Okay, so uh, sometimes, and, and you already mentioned that, um, Sometimes teachers are active in the front and students are passive. So uh, here's a quote, rather than taking the stage, teachers should set the stage to engage. So it's not your show, okay? It's the, the student's show. So what you need to do is to set the conditions uh, for students to engage, okay? Uh, and of course, something that is obvious, we're teaching a language, right? So mastering active communication skills requires engaging in active language practice. So this, <clears throat> even if this uh, seems uh, obvious, it's, it's good to point out. Now, so, some of you mentioned games, and a lot of these principles are related to uh, the psychology of video games. Uh, how video games uh, are appealing for uh, participants. So why are they appealing? Because the participants are the actors who define what happens to them, actively making choices that direct the action. So make the students the actors. Um, so how do we do this? These are some practical recommendations. Immediately get learners to do something hands-on at the start of the class. Okay, get them to do something right from the get-go. Uh, making more interactive tasks, and this is something that you mentioned also. So, for example, you have uh, applications like uh, Flickers, Kahoot. You can use cards, Real Realia, 
and, and props. Props are objects, uh, objects that really are the real objects that you use. If you're talking about a plant, you use a plant. And a prop is an object that represents that uh, real object. Uh, active learning ap approach, role plays, power breaks, and we mentioned power breaks before. So what are some other specific actions to take uh, when designing engaging tasks? And let's see how we're doing in time. Uh, we still have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. And let me mention some other recommendations related to these uh, principles. So we have action uh, number one, uh, or something that we can do is start with deliberately small steps. Um, and again, we're thinking about designing a task. So you can take the task and be incremental in the steps that the students uh, take when, when they are doing the task. So start with deliberately small steps and make them more complex as you go, or as they go. Building surprise and the wow, wow factor. We already mentioned this. Um, always try to think of how you can surprise the students, unexpected things. Um, so th this will create an ex expectation and they will want to participate in your tasks because oh, the, this teacher always brings things that are surprising and, and take you know, a left turn somewhere. And, so we have action uh, three, building mystery and puzzles. Again, very related to action two, mystery, things you need to discover. We don't know how this is gonna turn out. Uh, create cliffhangers. So cliffhangers, I don't know if you're familiar with that word. This is word that they use. Um, I think this comes from old series, that um, action series. And you have an episode of this series where the end, at the end of the, of the series, the hero is hanging for, from a cliff, is hanging, and you don't know if the, the hero is going to die or, or not. But of course, you know he's, gonna, he's not going to die. But uh, the, the, this episode ends, so you really want to see the next episode to see how the hero is going to solve the problem. So this is a cliffhanger. So this means um, maybe dividing tasks in parts and one part of the task ends in a cliffhanger. So you really need to know what happens next, okay? Uh, and then use questions to trigger curiosity. This is uh, something that I'm, I'm sure all of you use. What do you think? What would happen if, right? Use questions, okay. So um, then how do we sustain engagement on learning tasks? As I said before, um, many of the things that I already mentioned is going to apply here. So here we already have them in the, in the, um, in the attraction and we want them to stay in the ride, okay? To stay there and to finish the ride. So um, here, we need to make the contrast between authentic engagement versus mere on-task behavior. And I, I already mentioned that, okay? Um, you can keep them on task, but maybe they are not engaged. Um, and be careful with digital technology because it can easily become mere gimmickry if it is employed without clear learning intent. What does this mean? Uh, you can just, it can be just fireworks. Right? Ah, oh, we're using all this technology, but what is the objective of what you're doing? Is, it, uh, is there a clear objective? So don't use technology for technology's sake. Uh, just have a clear focus in mind. Um, okay, let me move on here. And again here, uh, we're gonna take from the psychology of video gaming. And we already mentioned this. People are the heroes and the agents of their, their, their destiny. They are not just being told the story, but are the story. This is very important. Uh, okay, this is related to the first. Uh, and then this is also related to gaming theory. Uh, when you're playing a game, you can fail, but nothing is going to happen. You, 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 you're going to have another chance, right? So the risk of failure has no consequences since they have the chance to replay, practice, and improve. So you really need to make this clear, right? And make, uh, design the task so 
so that the students know that they can um, fail, you will give them feedback, and uh, there's no consequence there. It is also highly social and interactive, leading to collaboration. This is related to gaming, and this is something that we can apply in the tasks. So learner action is key. Um, okay, let me move here. Okay, so let's talk about the principles for sustaining engagement on learning tasks. So we have the first principle, provide a cognitive challenge. We already mentioned this. We're going to repeat a couple of things. Principle two, maximize enjoyment, minimize boredom. And this is, of course, uh, it sounds obvious, but we're still going to discuss this, and this is very important. Captivate attention and engage interest. Principle four, utilize the power of unpredictability. And principle five, stagger accomplishments. Uh, stagger means um, divide uh, the accomplishment, di divide a, a larger goal into smaller goals. Okay, so provide cognitive challenge. Um, and here uh, is, we need what they call desirable difficulty either too easy nor too difficult. And I think we, we're all familiar with the zone of proximal development, uh, Vygotsky's um, theory. And when something is challenging and it, it makes you make connections and think, it's easier to remember. The information is easier to remember. And this is, a, and here, it, uh, there's something that I already mentioned. Um, simplifying the language doesn't mean dumbing down the topics. So, um, of course, we, ha we know these activities that maybe in certain contexts can be uh, useful, but, you know, you're, you're studying the colors and you put a pen in front of your students and you say, what color is the pen? Everybody's going to say red. Okay, so again, it depends on the context, right? But the, the fact that you're, you're studying the colors and they don't have lots of resources, doesn't mean that you cannot create something that is challenging in other ways, not necessarily linguistically, but in other ways. So, for example, um, here, if you're studying vocabulary related to animals, uh, you can make a cat categorization activity, okay? Which animals fly, which swim, which uh, swim, which move on land. Um, so, there's some analysis going on there. And of course, here we can uh, use uh, our old friend's taxonomy, Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, so try to use activities that, that develop higher order thinking. Principle number two, maximize enjoyment, minimize boredom. So we need to do exactly the opposite of what we see in the cartoon. And here, um, when we're talking about this, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about emotions, okay? So one uh, metaphor that the, the author uses is that uh, the emotions are like a huge elephant. And your, your rationality is the rider on the top. If the elephant doesn't want to go somewhere, the rider is not going to do it. It's not going to... So, if emotionally they are not invested, uh, no matter how they try and they, right, they're, they're not going to be engaged. So that's why we need to manipulate the elephant so that we get them to where we want. Okay, so tasks need to have emotional pull for the learners to get their elephant interested in moving along that path. So uh, something important that we need to clarify here, and this is something contrasting to the metaphor that I used before related to the attraction in the park. So this is, we need to make the difference between enjoyment and fun. Uh, things need to be enjoyable, but it's not that, you know, you're not the entertainer of the students. It's not that they need to be laughing every five seconds. And uh, the idea is not that they, you know, um, it's not a party, uh, all, you know, the class. Um, this is not, because this can be distracting, and that is not your role. Your role is for things to be enjoy, en enjoyment, uh, but um, 
but uh, not necessarily fun. So I'm almost out of time here. Um, maybe let me just uh, go quickly with the with the rest of the principles. Um, okay, so captivate attention, engage interest. Um, and here uh, we need a learner's commitment and investment in wanting to work on the task. And we need to reduce external distractions. Okay. Um, yeah, there was lots of information here. Uh, I think I overdid it. Um, so um, just on passing, I'm going to mention that it's important to develop metacognitive skills so, so that students can assess their own uh, progress in the tasks. Okay. And... Uh, this, this is something that I already mentioned before, appeal to interest, situational interest. Okay, I'm um, going to leave that there and you can review it later. And just to mention, utilize the power of unpredictability. And the last principle, stagger accomplishments. As I said before, um, to uh, break down a larger goal into uh, smaller goals. So um, you will have access to the video and the presentation so you can uh, take a look uh, later. Okay, uh, unfortunately, I ran out of time here. Um, and just to finish here, um, this is uh, the book that I recommend uh, where they explain this in, in a lot of detail and uh, Again, I'm not in any way affiliated to Cambridge. This is a real recommendation. I think this is a very, very uh, important uh, book. So uh, we're going to finish there. And I don't know if you have any topics. I'm sorry I, I needed to rush at the end. I think I miscalculated the, the time. But again, you're going to have access to the presentation and the video. So let's see if we have any, any questions or comments. I think we're having uh, some technical issues with the audio there. We apologize. Uh, we're going to fix uh, the issue in a second. Uh, maybe while while they fix, uh, I'm going to comment on on a couple of the things that uh, Trisha was mentioning, but maybe you weren't able to to hear. Uh, and she was mentioning uh, several comments that you made, and you mentioned uh, needs analysis. Definitely, needs analysis is what what uh, what we we talked about. Knowing your students, uh, motivation is key to learn. Definitely. Um, and by the way, uh, as a, as a uh, side point here, 
uh, this author also, as you can see, I'm a big fan of this author. <laughs> so uh, this author also has a book on motivation. And uh, he makes a difference, distinction between motivation and engagement. So uh, you can have very motivated students, but you can create tasks that are not engaging and you lose them, right? So you can have a, a student that comes to the class and really wants to learn, but the teacher destroys that motivation by not designing engaging tasks. So this is something uh, that I really recommend. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, maybe just... Okay, I think that we've been able to fix the problems that we were having. Um, as I mentioned before, thank you, Mr. Gomez, for your presentation on designing these engaging tasks uh, for our classrooms and for giving us those practical recommendations to help our students get, and more importantly, stay engaged in the learning tasks. Um, I did mention to you, you were the only one that was able to hear them at the time, uh, some of the comments made by those who are, are joining this session. Um, I had a question. I don't see any other questions uh, here. So I had a question. Um, when we have our classroom and we want to make engaging tasks, we know that uh, we have students who are interested in certain topics, others who are interested in others. How can we choose the topic that will be of most interest for our students? Or what is your recommendation in, the, in that case? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. I think that's, that's uh, a, a dilemma that we have uh, every day, right? Especially if we have large groups. So one thing that this author mentions is if you have a large group, try to select target students uh, for different tasks and change that target group um, each, each time you design a task. So for example, you think of a task and you think, oh, these five students really like BTS, for example. Uh, so something related to that, okay? Uh, of course, you need to create it so that somehow you awaken curiosity for the rest of the students, but you can have a, a concrete group of students from that class. Then the next task that you design, you choose another group of students for the other task. So, um, I mean, there are certain topics and certain types of tasks that are kind of generic. We, we mentioned, uh, for example, topics that are interesting for us as human beings, like things that we ask ourselves all the time, right? Like the meaning of life and things like that. So you can uh, choose these type of topics, but um, in certain cases, you for maybe uh, it won't fit what you're studying, et cetera. So in the, this other scenario, what I would recommend would be to choose groups of students and to design tasks so that everyone is served at some point during the, the session. So that would be uh, a recommendation on what you mentioned. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sergio Gomez, for your contribution to this seminar, seminar. And we're sure your insights will be very useful for all of our teachers. Um, Thank you very much.